Um, Happy New Year. It's the uh, year of the monkey. And so, Happy New Year to all of you. And I'm delighted to have uh, Paul with us today. He, may, he came here all the way from uh, the Australian Open Tennis uh, Championship. Although he stopped for one day probably at Stanford in a way, but uh, he was there during the games. And um, Paul uh, and I have known each other for some years. Uh, he's really known among the community not only as an excellent uh, clinician, scientist, but also somebody who really is a champion for new approaches, new technologies, and uh, every it's every other year, almost every year, he organizes this one-day meeting uh, combined to uh, science, clinicians, and the industry on uh, new state-of-the-art techniques and technologies, which have been remarkable. Uh, he received his undergraduate, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but he received his, I know it's many years ago, but he received his undergraduate nevertheless in uh, Harvard in biochemical sciences and then MD from Columbia University in New York. I think you did your fellowship in Brigham. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And then uh, he's been in Stanford for many years. Yeah, tough so, yeah. so we'll hear about yeah. the future of treating arrhythmias. Uh, thank thanks for coming. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Yoram. And uh, obviously what uh, you all have built up here is incredibly impressive. And, uh, Really, I'm uh, very honored to be here. So, you know, just, uh, so um, uh, really uh, uh, honored and respectful for all of you accomplished in the field. So, uh, 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 do I use this or not? Or doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay. So, um, what I'll talk Everybody about. Everybody cannot hear very well. Then. Can you guys hear okay? Okay. So, this is. I'll take you a whirlwind through some different concepts. Uh, in kind of future thoughts and arrhythmias, and then I'll talk to you about my thoughts about medical device innovation. So um, obviously the field is, you know, expansive, like huge. So I, I'm not going to talk about everything, of course. So it's not because I don't think it's important. So I want to slight anybody's, you know, vision or work. But it's just, you know, kind of my thoughts. We'll just go through. Okay. So. Um, <coughs> You know, certainly one of the most important things is really understanding mechanism etiology, and I'll, I'll touch upon that. Unless we understand mechanism, we probably can't accomplish anything. So it really always starts there. So when we talk about new therapies, innovation, it really always has to come from a better understanding of, of the science and the physiology. So if there's a number of different, you know, things that we can do, identifying mechanisms, identifying patients at risk, monitoring, you know, site of origin, things that um, uh, ways in which we can modulate selectively uh, the, the properties of tissue, et cetera. So we'll touch upon a number of these things. But the, the big thesis is really that there is a revolution that uh, basically you all are part of, uh, and I think you know, you've chosen, chosen the right field, you know, in my opinion. Um, but as I'll argue is we need more people uh, like yourselves in this field. And that's really what's necessary to foster things and getting from here to there, so to speak. Um, so that's that's really it, and and really what we've seen is that you know so luckily over the last several decades, huge explosion in physics, chemistry, material science, engineering, but medicine were relatively late. I think Yoram and I agree on that very much. That um, those things are going to transform medicine, how we care for patients, examine and make the diagnosis, and so the opportunity you all have are really to revolutionize, really change dramatically the entire care of patients. And that's, that's really the promise, I think, of, of the future. So that's why I'm so excited. Um, obviously, as somebody in arrhythmias, we have a lot to be, you know, to focus on. There's huge, huge problems, right, that affect uh, millions of people. And so we'll touch upon some of these areas. But I think, you know, as this room represents, uh, most of the advances are going to be from 
large collaborations from this whole range of disciplines, right? And I've included, you know, the, the things that you would understand, uh, bioengineering, applied physics, computer science, but I've included psychology and human factors work as well. And so there's many perspectives that have to be considered as we go forward and move together as a field. So uh, I'll start with sudden death. Uh, all of you, I think, have some uh, concept of the magnitude of the problem. It's enormous. And honestly, we've done only modestly in terms of really changing this problem, really. We've done, there have been huge things, but clearly, I think, in a perspective, it's very modest. Uh, so that still, you know, virtually 1,000 people die every day of sudden cardiac death, which is, ex you know, extraordinary to think about. How you can have a condition that if you went to a, you know, a lay audience, and you told them that a thousand people die of anything, and they never heard of sudden cardiac death, they'd say, what do you mean? That's impossible. But of course it really is, and, and so it's a major problem that we have to deal with. So this is huge. You know, again, if you said to them, uh, I'm going to tell you about a condition in which kills more people every year than lung cancer and breast cancer combined, they'd say, oh, that doesn't exist, right? That's got to be a there's no problem bigger than that, but it is. And so that's why we all have to work together in solving this. And so the, the problem, and this is one really, I think, very special thing or very unique thing about arrhythmias, right? It's not like, and in, in I tell you know, patients and lay audiences all the time, if, if you had, a, say, a, you know, a devastating tumor, let's say, the chances are if you took a CT scan today, it's going to look about the same tomorrow. But as you know, you know, as your, you know, uh, taught us all, instantly it'll look different. The electrical patterns of the heart look different. So the problem is very dynamic, so dynamic it presents some major problems, and no greater than in cardiac arrest, right? Because so what is the survival? You know, how much does it drop with every minute? Uh, Chris? Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, boy, he's heard everything. So yes, that's right. But that's extraordinary, right? So to have a condition in which your survival drops that quickly is almost unheard of, right? There are very few things in medicine that are of that kind of nature, right? And so this is a you know, famous slide that looks at that. Um, and so what's the average survival of cardiac arrest? Well, obviously this is a moving target and it changes, but you know, it's somewhere just around 10, maybe a little more than that. But that's extraordinary to have a condition that's been recognized for decades and their survival is still somewhere around 10 or 15%. How can that condition exist, right? It really seems impossible. But that's the kind of challenge and the magnitude of the challenge that we have in front of us. Um, and that's been a big, you know, a really big question. So, implantable defibrillators, ICDs, you're all aware of those. What's the success? If you were to have an episode of ventricular fibrillation right in front of us, what's the likelihood that you will survive? It's really high. It's somewhere above 98%. You know, you could quibble whether it's 99, 99.5, whatever it is, but the odds are you're going to survive, right? So there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of technology that we've solved, but obviously the fact that there's still such a high risk of sudden death means we've not solved many of the problems. Um, this is just work from ICDs that basically survival is greater, the number of people to be treated is, no, is relatively modest, eight people need to be treated for one life saved in a period of a fall of about less than 10 years. So we have the capacity to change this. This is an electrical uh, disorder in other words. Uh, so we have some of the answer, we just don't know, all. we don't have all of the answers. So you can imagine, really, that that's why people like NBC's, uh, you know, broadcaster died in the studio when there was an LED, but it wasn't used properly, et cetera, et cetera, and he died. Right? So that can still happen today. And so what do we have as choices? We have a choice of the best thing would be to prevent the disorder by far, ameliorate the disease, that would be by far. But if you can't do that, you've got to resuscitate the patient, right? And right now, really the only two really ways fundamentally are you've got to get electricity to them very quickly, either externally or internally. Right now, you pretty much argue there aren't many other solutions right now, right? Uh, but we have to have some way of making this better. So how can you do that? Well, some of the problems are going to be through more kind of societal issues, right? How do you distribute AEDs? How do you pass laws that say where AED should be? Can you invent 
uh, new technology. How do you transport these? Should they be transported by drones? So someone you know gets gets activated and they bring it to you. Um, should it be personal? So should you in your pocket have a cell phone that has an AED attached to it? I don't know. Can you make it cost? So you can actually distribute these less than a hundred dollars, rather than less than a thousand dollars. You have to carry it around, and people don't. And there's minimal maintenance and no battery life considerations, right? It'll last ten years, et cetera. So could we get to that stage? Would that solve the problem of sudden cardiac death? A lot of questions. But you kind of get my, you know, uh, you know, drift of my ideas are that I think we need to address these. These are big societal issues, and we have to figure out a solution to them. So one of, the, one of the things that has been observed in studies that they've done is about half the people who die uh, in homes are not monitored. So their, their family are not there, they're not, they're, they, live, they live alone, or their family members weren't there and they die anyway, or they die in their sleep. So we don't have any capacity to monitor people currently. There's no known way to do that, right? There's no way, oh, if you have sudden cardiac death, that someone is going to know to resuscitate you. Call 911, bring an AD over. So that's a, a major need that I would identify that we need to challenge to have a solution. But there are certain almost insurmountable, it seems, kind of specifications. Like you're not going to, your family member is not going to wear something and put something on every day, you know, right? Because probably the technology exists. We have these wearable life vests. But you're not going to go home without it. Every the whole population of the world is not going to wear one of these things. It's not practical. So no one has solved these problems, right? There's no monitoring ability to do that. You may have, you know, gone to some lecture where they have monitoring through chairs, through cloth, et cetera. So we have little glimpses of solutions, but no one's come up with a real compelling solution to this. So this is something that we've got to solve. There are also multiple rhythms now. As you see the trend, many of these are non-shockable rhythms. So there are bradyarrhythmias, asystole, et cetera, pulse of selective activity. Some of these are, are end stage, right? So that's some of the reason. But there are also things that you know, need to be uh, treated in some way. So we're going to probably, in my prediction, borrow from these advances in technology and communications, the ability to create networks. Uh, you know, As you know now, we can get communication anywhere. It's going to dramatically improve monitoring, better sensors, all those kind of things that I think will be necessary to really come up with these really tough solutions to sudden cardiac death. A number of the conditions, as you know, are ischemic based, right? It's the beginning of a myocardial infarction, ischemic uh, mediated VT. We don't have the capacity really to identify early myocardial infarction even, except for symptoms, right? I have to complain, I have chest pain, I don't feel well, I call 911, somebody luckily hopefully gets to me in time. We don't have a capacity to monitor people at home that isn't available currently. Could it be? Yes, absolutely, right? We know an EKG will likely detect most people's acute myocardial infarction, but again, it's that practical nature of not being able to do it that is really a gap from here to there. So there are a lot of problems like this that really technologically, we kind of have the answer now, but no one's really figured out the social, societal, you know, kind of way to do this. And so is there a whole, you know, even when we say business model, we would say to do this. I'll touch upon some of the advances that we have seen. So subcutaneous ICD. So they used to all be, well, they used to be all epicardial through surgery, right? <laughs> and, and became transvenous and now have gone back to subcutaneous. And we'll talk about some of the things. So some of the questions are, how do you improve shocking models? Uh, so this was a, a, a fellow, Matt Jolly, who worked with us and John Schreibman in Boston in doing some of the you know, finite element modeling. And so, and again, in my opinion, a lot of this needs to be done still. It really hasn't been done. So could you improve the dip difference between thresholds? That's one area. Would it improve performance, decrease battery size? Now, in my opinion, uh, the fact that ICD shocks hurt. So most of you probably have never really directly spoken with somebody who's been shocked. But those of us who deal with this every day know that a lot of people are really traumatized from shocks, right? Because it's really painful, it's startling more than anything else, and it really disrupts their quality of life. It's a major impact in quality of life. So one of the big needs for our area, in my opinion, is to make it painless. So the question is, how could you do that? Well, first, we do antitachycardia pacing. 
So Yorm showed me an example of a patient that was uh, being monitored with ECGI, where actually antithetic pacing worked right at that second. So that's really valuable because that's not painful, right? So you can have that every day, even maybe a couple times a day, and probably live a pretty full life. If you got shocked every day, you'd be begging me to take turn this thing off. You know, I would I would uh, argue that. So there have been a number of different things, that, and I'll talk about that. I think I have a slide coming up. Yeah, this is a summary of a few different approaches. Um, uh, so uh, a Faraday cage approach that Ron Berger proposed about 20 years ago about kind of encapsulating the heart, you know, et cetera, probably makes it less painful, but you can't defibrillate from the outside anymore. So that's a big negative. Um, this is some of the work that Ron did with uh, Natalia Chayanova. Um, and this is work that um, you know, Igor did while he was here and continues uh, in terms of low energy therapy. So there are a variety of different approaches um, to do this. I think we need to solve this. And so that's one of the big areas I would say we are going to probably see something. This is some work with one of our colleagues. Um, it's basically this different energy form. Uh, Natalia has done a similar thing. You'll see this is a um, single cell, uh, single, <laughs> sorry, layer. Uh, cellular preparation and so there's this area that becomes free of activation because of this so-called I, I call it like a electric fence kind of thing that for electric activity so they're doing some work on this area there's, there's been some work to create an electrical CPR device that basically uses this so-called medium voltage therapy to try to improve cardiac output essentially for mainly pulseless electric activity and that's never really kind of taken up and you know People haven't figured that out. But it's a, there's a need there, I would say. This is some of the work that was done by one of our fellows uh, working with a guy named Carl Dieseroth, who was a pioneer in this field called optogenetics, where they take a, um, from algae, rhodopsin, and they implant it into mammalian cells and get expressed. And so they're able to basically both affect um, uh, in terms of stimulation as well as inhibition uh, using different uh, constructs that they can insert. So it's able to modulate the electrical properties of each cell. And so that's one of the work, uh, certainly, uh, this is being worked around the world for, uh, for neuro neurons, but uh, a smaller number of investigators, uh, Lior Gepstein being another one is a pioneer in this area, cardiac tissue. So this is the idea that you can individually control cells, uh, this is with gene therapy clearly, uh, but to be able to then modulate each cell uh, for a whole set of cells. Uh, so obviously other areas are that of more in the lines of uh, alteration and, and um, uh, uh, repair. So much as stem cells has been uh, you know, uh, uh, proposed for cellular repair, there are many strategies in terms of repairing other properties, being conduction properties, et cetera, uh, that I think will, will eventually be quite important. So altering ion channel expression, gap junction, function, expression, distribution, which we know are altered in most conditions, uh, evolving arrhythmias, the fibrosis and extra cellular matrix, uh, also those pathways are becoming well known and eventually might be able to be disturbed. I think the hardest part for a lot of these is that you don't want to disturb the entire body, you want to deal with these directly in the organ system. So there are certainly additional challenges that are being directed in this area, but I think important. So coming back to the ICD, um, we all know that uh, there are now um, uh, leadless pacemakers, so that certainly the next generation will be a leadless pacemaker with a subcutaneous ICD. That's pretty much a, you know, I think an inevitable thing, so that'll be an interesting phase. You're all aware of the MRI compatibility of devices. That's something that's really been a very practical advance as well. This is something that probably never will see the light of day, I don't think, but was developed in the, the Research Triangle in uh, North Carolina. It's a transvenous defibrillator. So what they did was they made it as a form factor that it would fit within the, um, uh, the heart and the venous system. And so it basically is entirely in the transvenous. There's no lead. So it's a, basically a bigger device that's kind of uh, like a leadless pacemaker, but bigger because it has to have the batteries and the capacitors, et cetera. So all possible for engineering. These are not, uh, many of these things are solvable, and engineering has come so far that you know, these are all very feasible kind of uh, devices. 
Uh, future algorithms for better discrimination are really essential. And so, uh, Yoram and I talked about this. Certainly, computer science has really got to make it to devices, and they really haven't. Uh, and that's one of the big areas I, I think that we're going to need to have to work on. So a, a few words just about transformative technology. You know, I'll say it's, you know, think about computer chip rather than a new calculator when you want to do new things, you know, so you have to really think out of the box. So one of the things that I talk about in looking at an ICD, so I, I gave this t a talk at AHA on um, the ICD of the future. So I said one way to think about this is to think about your car. What is going to happen to your car in the next five to ten years? it's going to be a really different vehicle, right? I mean, we all know that, right? What's going to happen? Well, they're going to be stronger and lighter, right? They're, and I saw in some commercial from BMW, right? They're making them out of carbon fiber, right? Some really strong, really durable material that's much lighter, right? Um, less expensive, hopefully, right? Uh, reliability, right? One of the big issues of devices is reliability. They're going to become much more reliable, comfortable, more consumer issues. Powering, that might even change. Uh, these are some of the things that are really important. Um, and some of the solutions we have, right? We're talking material, communication, right? We know right now cars can be tracked, you can find them, you can do whatever you want. Um, it's going to have a lot of data about, you know, you, who you are, etc. You can use multiple energy sources, we call that hybrid now. Artificial intelligence, it can drive itself, right? That's, a, that's definitely going to happen. They park, the ones you can buy now, you know, they park themselves. Um, you know, they, you know, you'll know different things. You'll know who, en who enters the car. You know, all these kind of things. It'll recharge itself. All these things of da data gathering and, you know, uh, basically new analytics are built into these things, right? So this is, these are the kind of things that are exactly going to be in medical devices and, and, in fact, I would say defibrillators. So we have a very good model in the world of how these advances are going to happen. It's just in medicine they haven't come yet. And so these are the things that, you know, you all, everybody will be involved in. So leads that will be un made of unbreakable materials, redundancy in generators, redundant components, improved uh, testing, all these kind of things will become, you know, general. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether we'll ever have rechargeable batteries. We may or may not. I don't know if we're going to have, you know, some kind of body motion or body generated kind of, and re-energizing of batteries, but these are all possible, uh, you know, from an engineering point of view. Communication for sure, right? That's, you know, we know the cell phones can do so much. Obviously, defibrillators are going to go the next step with communication, right? We know that, right? They already have wireless communication, but you'll be able to monitor them anywhere, anytime in the future. That'll all be possible with better battery technology, all these different things and di using different frequencies. Um, the event, you know, storage capacity will be immensely greater, right? We'll have the ability uh, to upload to a cloud. It's not going to be limited, you know, it says device full. That's not going to happen anymore. We're going to have unlimited amount of capacity when it really is able to do all these things. We're going to have much more a data collection, right? It's going to serve the, the human better, right? It's going to serve as a way to record things better. Um, uh, have more ability to understand what's happening to the patient's body and heart through more sensors. So it's going to serve as a greater function, just therapeutic. It's going to have a bigger diagnostic role with the capacity. This is just, uh, you all know iRhythm, which was, you know, basically a patch electrode. That's a tattoo electrode, right? So all these things are going to be possible. Sensors and the implantable devices are going to talk to these, right? So that's going to, that's, I think, virtually an inevitability of what happens. This is a, a group, Zen uh, uh, Bowles at Stanford, and one of her claims of fame is she was part of the first team in, uh, to develop uh, flexible uh, chips. So to be able to translate electronics into flexible platforms is really important, obviously. Uh, communicate with other devices. Uh, many of you already know about the different sensors, atrial uh, se pressure sensors, other kinds of uh, artery pressures. Uh, from external data, you might be able to basically, or I'm sure you'll be able to accumulate all this data together and have all this available to you. Uh, additional hemodynamic, self-adjusting devices, you know, CRT devices for sure will self-adjust based on feedback hemodynamics, I think, and uh, changing to the environment, whatever it is. 
So I think those are very important things. When you talk about beyond the um, defibrillator, uh, you know, techniques like ECGI will be used in, in terms of identifying patients at risk, right? We don't, one of the big problems, and in fact, one of the central problems is the people who get the defibrillator is only a small fraction of the people who need the defibrillator. We, that has to be changed. We have to have better ways of predicting who's at risk. And that's really one of the biggest issues. That'll be done through modeling as well, other kinds of provocative testing, in my opinion, and um, you know, selecting people who have the most benefit and also the least benefit as well uh, will get to fibrillators. So these are, uh, don't look at the timelines, I just threw this up for fun. You know, just to see there is a timeline. Some of these are gonna take a long time. Stem cell, cell therapy for arrhythmias, uh, painless ICD, you know, drugs to modulate gap junction function, you know, rechargeable ICDs. It's gonna take a, a, some time. But I think these are all gonna happen in my opinion. Uh, so, just going to atrial fibrillation is another entity just to share some thoughts about it. You know, clearly, we start with etiology and mechanism, right? So we have to understand better what are the predisposing factors, uh, things like obesity, uh, sleep apnea, other things we, we need to know. We're learning a lot more about it, right? We know more about how atrial fibrillation occurs. We know a lot about the ultrastructural changes that occur in, in terms of extracellular matrix, fibrosis, connected ion channel, and then some of the functional changes in terms of refractoriness for conduction uh, abnormalities, et cetera. So we're learning huge amounts about atrial fibrillation as we, we speak, more about triggers, interaction between the local environment, et cetera, uh, in different uh, patterns that occur, rotors, et cetera. And so these are all important, but we don't know all the answers in humans particularly, how you can image this better, functionally uh, examine it, look for all these different computational solutions, which they likely will be. Uh, imaging MRI, most of you have seen this work. Uh, this is uh, from the Utah group. Uh, they've used MRI to classify patients. So we need ways to do this better uh, on a functional basis. Um, you know, th this is really important. And, other, you know, in vivo microscopy techniques. Uh, so we, we've talked most about these. I'll skip that. Um, and this is actually kind of the same. So mechanism. These are from Sandy the Ryan, my recent colleague. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of these. Uh, the idea that there may be rotational patterns that are visible, uh, which he calls rotors, and you can argue whether they are rotors. But uh, so, and there are a variety of different. Uh, results. So electrogram studies in humans have really failed to show ro rotors in most of the studies, whereas most of the optical studies have shown some rotational activity. And so there's a variety of different work, and I'll, I'll go on and show some of these. This is um, uh, from Vadim Fedorov, um, who used to work with Igor, uh, and some of his recent work. This is in explanted human hearts. So to me, this is one of the uh, very valuable steps in understanding the physiology of atrial fibrillation. So it's a perfused uh, either wedge or Langendorf type preparation where he's with optical mapping has examined uh, and identified these reentrant uh, uh, circuits. And he's related to different fiber tracts, uh, uh, papillary muscles, et cetera, different anatomic uh, substrates. So we're, we have a glimpse of this. This is the first look at how we can go about uh, looking at this. And he's he uses a high-resolution CT scan to compare this to. Um, yeah, so, oops, let me go back one. Oh, okay, whatever. Okay, so this is actually some recent work. Uh, this is Sandy's slide from, from the abstract that basically used the firm uh, map at the same time that they used a optical map, trying to demonstrate, and you could argue whether you believe it or not, uh, a, a similar rotational kind of uh, pattern. So that needs to be validated. Clearly much more work needs to be done in real, you know, in real life, et cetera, and we'll learn more about the mechanism of atrial fibrillation. Uh, some of the limitation has been with electrode recordings in atrial fibrillation, and so that's one of the uh, questions about how to, you know, improve it computationally. This is from Sanjeev. Uh, this is uh, he put together a uh, kind of a series 
uh, different uh, kind of results, basically, for a single procedure for uh, the rotor mapping plus pulmonary vein isolation. And you can see the, the overall success is, is reasonable. You know, again, studies to de determine whether it's superior are still, in my uh, opinion, not out yet. So we'll know more about where it's to be. If you put that down, I don't know. We'll have to see. Okay, this is the group. Uh, and this is actually a nice, this is one of his earlier patients. Oops. Um, and you can see there the rotational activity there that yeah, it looks like this. Uh, he put this together for me. This is a, a slide showing different attempts uh, to look at um, uh, AF sources. This is some e e e C uh, ECGI work, uh, which you all uh, uh, know about much more than I do. Um, and we'll go on. So one of the big questions, uh, and Rick and I talked about this, so the, I call it the surgical paradigm, and that is to be able to create a single procedure to prevent recurrence over the long time when surgery has accomplished. So can we do that in, an, in another kind of uh, mode? So can we, this other paradigm is what I call the contemporary treatment paradigm. That is, you take what you have now, try to learn about the environment, and treat it. But will that result in the same kind of long-term results as another kind of paradigm that is designed to basically look at what exists now, in my opinion, and potentially what can happen tomorrow? So that's, I think, one of the biggest questions in our field is really is which general paradigm should we go after and what's the direction? Uh, so natural history of disease is really important, understanding you know, what uh, does it affect certain regions preferentially, therefore could you predict it? Could you actually kind of take a sample of areas that even haven't developed the substrate for atrial fibrillation, but are likely to in the next few years? Is that knowable, is that not knowable? We need to figure these things out. Uh, so that's related to this whole issue. Can you individualize lesion sets, is that possible? Can you learn enough about the patient at the time to be able to, to you know, uh, to actually create a lesion set that's going to work? And so that's one of the, the big, I think, questions. So obviously, Cox Maze and Cox Maze uh, surgery has been one of the first attempts. There are obviously uh, less in invasive surgical approaches to this, whether it be thoracoscopic, so-called hybrid surgery, catheter ablation, and other improved catheter ablation lesion sets. And we have not developed them. I mean, this is a problem with our field currently. We just don't know what else to do. Uh, so endocardial, epicardial solutions to this except, you know, are being looked at. One of the things that we've kind of talked about is better lesion formation. We've talked a little bit about mapping, but how do you accomplish that? So certainly we have better ways of better contact. Our control is only a little better. Our energy source is only a little better. And we don't have a good assessment of lesion formation, in my opinion. So those are needs, those are things that are solvable, that engineering solutions I think can have, you know, so we can see a variety of energy sources, some have some benefit. Um, you all have experience with linear accelerators as well, so are there external sources, uh, that kind of thing. This is a, uh, I still call this one of the holy grails of robotics, and for this is autonomous function in, um, for catheter ablation. So one of my uh, paradigms is that humans are good, but just like for cars, my belief is that cars, and many people believe this, and other people don't, that we'd be better off if all cars were driven by robots, not by people. Uh, I would venture at some point, robots are gonna be smarter than people and better in even doing things like catheter ablation. And they probably should be developed too. So they're more reliable and can really do a better job. And so uh, these guys at Stanford are working on that. Uh, how do you actually uh, improves the ability to maintain contact. So a lot of ways. One is to measure it. So we have our first ability to measure contact. But are there other ways, right? So you have a better control system. So whether it's robotics or your hand, or et cetera. So we decided to, and I've been working on this for a while, longer than I didn't care to admit. Um, but we came up with this solution that is kind of designed here, uh, which is basically to try to convert what I think is a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. So the idea is that no one needs to ablate in the middle of the, the heart. You only need to land, like a, I call it a moon rover, and you just need to walk around the area. So as long as you could stay in contact and could drive, you could get to anywhere in the heart you wanted, basically. And so I think it would be a lot easier to control, et cetera. So we've been working on this. Uh, we've definitely not solved this. 
Okay. So the other big problem is we can't even tell when we don't make lesions. So not only do we have problems of knowing where to go, when we make lesions, we probably make them in a crummy way, not a very good way, right? Not as good as our surgical colleagues, I think, in my opinion. So that's another big area, a so-called gap, you should say. So uh, there's a little startup that I kind of am following that uses this uh, NADH fluorescence to look for viability and changes, so it's something to watch. Uh, we've not done any work with them. This is some work we did just um, uh, trying to image directly. Uh, this was an in vivo study which we did uh, using a saline filled balloon and a fiber optic that we could, we could identify little gaps and lesions that we made. Um, we, we've been working with a, a guy who's a psychologist who's a specialist in vision uh, to try to basically use machine learning to try to teach this machine to see. And so part of it seeing is we asked it, can you work with us to try to see ablated tissue versus not ablated tissue? And it's using machine learning techniques to do that. Uh, so uh, we've talked a little bit about that for ventricular arrhythmias, et cetera, but for atrial arrhythmias as well, for changing uh, the pathways that are responsible for changes. And so I think a lot of these things, these are some of the future approaches, uh, conversion uh, related to electrical properties, uh, alteration of electrical properties early, early low energy defibrillation. So I bet none of you have ever worked with an external defibrillator uh, related to, uh, that was used for the atrium uh, because they it got FT approved, believe it or not, but no one ever used it. And why did they not use it? It wasn't because it didn't work, but no one could tolerate the shock. Uh, so that's another clear issue. If you could make it painless, that I would think some people at least would use one of those things, right? Some person that you can't treat necessarily with ablation, you don't have the, it's just not possible to do or an easy thing to do with risk benefit, you might be able to change that. And then we talked about kind of uh, altering or changing the voltage properties of individual cells. So this kind of is a summary of the future before I get into the last phase was to talk about medical device innovation. That basically our understandings of mechanism arrhythmias will be critical in fostering really future therapy. And then we need to create a community that's collaborative uh, to be able to accomplish these things. So what are some of the big challenges? So there is a mismatch between technology and needs, in my opinion. That is, we don't come up with the right needs, nor does, does industry necessarily. <coughs> uh, problems of going beyond the proof of principle experiment. So we might have a great idea and get so far, but it's very hard to go as far as you need to go. We don't have enough input. We don't have the engineering sources, even the business or input regarding <coughs> manufacturability. It's relatively simple things, but it doesn't necessarily reach it uh, to the in inventor. Uh, this is the so-called valley of death, which is the uh, gap between uh, innovation and early prototyping and commercialization. For many therapies, this gap is insurmountable or virtually insurmountable, particularly for the most in more invasive things. In academia, which we happen to be in, um, there's some great things, right? So we have science-based research, but in fact, and hypothesis-driven research, but there's limited, relatively limited technology translation that still really occurs in our universities. Um, researchers mm, generally aren't attracted to technology. There isn't even the pathways for promotion, for uh, funding, et cetera. Uh, so that re in even engineering research at most institutions is not uh, centered around medical device innovation. So academia may be one area, uh, and I'll, I'll also say that we're not trained for this area. But we just don't have, we've not seen that. This is the valley of death, the gap between uh, development, uh, the initial concept, and final commercialization, which is, could be very hard to get through. The other thing is you've probably heard about this concept of technology push. The engineering community may have a great technology, but it's associated for really need. And that's where many therapies have failed, right? They, they, they sound great, but there's really no need basis <coughs> in, the, in the real world that's gonna work. Mm -hmm. So starting with a need-driven uh, concept is really essential in my opinion. That is that there is a clinical market that is gonna find uh, this uh, a, a tremendous solution. So I argue that there's actually, it's a, it's somewhat of a number game that there are not enough people who are act, in fact working on these solutions, right? 
And so one anecdote I had was we worked with a computer science uh, grad student and you know, we had a lot of fun, it was great. So he got his PhD, he was gonna leave. And I said, well, what are you gonna go do? Well, I'm gonna go work for Toyota. Well, I said, really, okay. Yeah, they need computer scientists, you know, that's uh, very interesting. So he even had exposure to medical devices, et cetera, uh, with us, but he was gonna go get a job with, you know, a, you know, a car company. So there really is a lack of even exposure if people understand that these are careers. I mean, everybody in this room knows that, but that's, it's not the, the greater part of the world. And so there also needs to be more need finding uh, training, uh, more funding from industry, early exploration, really being able to, to drive a lot of these things, in my opinion, that are really there. This is the by design uh, concept or uh, program of how to approach a medical device innovation. <coughs> It actually starts with not one need, which is the way most of us do. Most of us have an area of interest. We become interested in it and do research in that area, and that becomes our need. But one of the strengths of their approach is that they look at a lot of needs. What does that really do? Well, the real benefit of that is that that need is very much uh, scrutinized. It's scrutinized in terms of whether it's ever going to lead to something beneficial. But at the very first step, and this is, I could have to give you one take home message for the innovation point of view, is you ask the question, based on your description of this need, if you come up with a solution with these specifications, would it actually become embraced by physicians, uh, patients, payers, regulatory approval, et cetera? And if you can answer yes, then it's probably very much worth your while in exploring. If your answer, however, is, and I don't think so, or maybe it's probably never worth even going through that step. And because of opportunity costs, that probably is not the way you should devote your uh, potentially you know, really valuable and limited resources on that area. And so that's the general idea. And so they start with these, these few needs, create many, many concepts, and then come up with a, some selection of a, 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 a candidate a concept based on these different issues of really whether it'll get to the actual person. So it's concept, going through prototype, making it all the way to commercialization that is a difficult thing. But what I think again is the collaboration is essential, <coughs> right? We need to collaborate between clinicians, engineers, create an engineering team, really have to have more sophisticated access to even intellectual property. You need fairly early business guidance to really be able to make a lot of this happen. This is the Stanford Biodesign, part of the BioX program in medical device innovation. Uh, this is actually you know, their concept kind of training. Uh, there is in fact, sorry, a book that they, is second edition, so anybody at all interested in medical devices, uh, grab a copy of these, get it from your library, uh, buy a copy, it's, it, it's the how-to book on how to do this. Uh, this is an innovation team. This is one of the first teams when I got to Stanford. So a uh, bioengineer from Duke, mechanical engineer from Florida. Uh, he was a, a EP fellow from UCSF and an MBA at Stanford. And so what happened to them? Well, she went to work at Proteus, now has, has one of her own startups. Uh, he went to work with Medtronic and has been involved with a lot of the uh, AF work. Uh, Uday Kumar founded iRhythm. And uh, Joe White joined Boston Scientific and now is part of one of the uh, local startups. So these people, you know, had limited, you know, they were, they were basically out of training, you know, and they really were launched into the area of medical devices. So it's possible, in other words. I think with the appropriate training and focus, it's possible to do this. These are just some of the companies that have come out of by design. Um, not obviously all of them have been successful. Uh, but uh, all of these at least have made it through uh, first round funding. Uh, but really the whole idea is that we need to train innovators. This is a alumni photo from I think the last year. Um, it gives you an idea there's a community now uh, and we need to create a worldwide community in my opinion. And that's really why, that's really my main take home message of how to do this. So uh, some of the things we need, we need to foster uh, industry innovation. I don't think industry gets it. <coughs> they have to see earlier and help out people in the early stages because they're not going to get any at the end. They're not going to get enough looks at the end otherwise. There's got to be some greater connection between NSF and NIH in terms of creating multidisciplinary 
groups that are most likely to create these innovative. Obviously in bioengineering, that's very much the case. Uh, even a request for proposal-driven innovation, I think is important. A coordination among regulatory agencies, so funding, regulatory, FDA, and reimbursement. We have things that have made it through the entire cycle, and at the end, the reimbursement agencies go, I'm not sure I want to reimburse that. Really? I mean, you know, uh, to make something go all that way, we need better guidance in terms of all these things, which will lower risk and make it much more feasible for people to go through this uh, really tough course. Uh, so as I mentioned, one of my big champion things is that we need to foster collaboration. We need to, you know, I say create prizes, but really what I'm saying is you need to have mechanisms of attracting talent. Uh, the best people, best minds in engineering, science, computer science, physics should be coming to explore this because it's for the good of humankind, right? I mean, obviously creating the next iPhone is going to help humankind, but I'd argue there are a lot of disease entities that need a lot of help, and that's one of the ways we could do it. So uh, even, I would say, a medical a academic discipline that has some focus on that. Uh, so I think, you know, again, we've talked about many of these advances. I think they're going to create the most important solutions we see, um, and um, I think these are the things we need to promote innovation. This is a meeting that uh, Joram talked about. It's a mm, one-day meeting. Uh, it's basically a whirlwind. So if you were ever at Stanford, this is right before Heartland Society. So if you're involved at all, uh, do come in and join us there. Um, it's a day-long meeting where 50 people talk about you know, the, what, what's happened in the last year. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And I'm really honored and delighted to be here. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, issues, anything around? So have I convinced anybody that it's a good thing to create a community in medical device innovation and technology innovation? So what do you think are the barriers for you and your career? Uh, what do you think? Is it doable, not doable? It's kind of daunting, right, to think that, oh yeah, I can make a difference in terms of creating a new technology that's actually going to make it to patients, because that's what it's about, right? So we're talking about that part that's beyond our, you know, hypothesis-driven science that's really critical. We are to take that and then apply it to patients. Um, what do you all think? Yeah, that's that's very interesting talk, and I know in talking with Igor and a number of people over the last few years, my eyes have been kind of opened up. And I know one of the things he's doing with George Washington is he's actually addressing teaching students things about regulatory affairs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. intellectual property yes. issues. I mean, you, you exactly. touched on a whole bunch of points exactly. throughout your thing exactly. there where you got MBAs and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And I think the classical education, not just in biomedical engineering, yes. but, but in all engineering and science, yes. is you work on engineering and science, yes. and then that sorts of stuff you go yes. you learn when you go to work at the company. Yes. So to yeah. speak. No, and, that's and, great no, point. And, and almost nobody really yes. addresses that and there's yes. very little understanding yes. Yes. Of, of those things which, yeah. which is I think been yes. a hindrance to innovation because yes. Yes. you know, until I got involved with yes. my first patent I had no yeah. idea about anything about patents. Yeah. You know? that's great. And never even thought about it. That's a great point. Yeah, in absolutely. fact it was it was, you know, almost kind of Thought to be somewhat impure if yes. you were you were yes. around making yeah. patents and yeah. stuff you did you know exactly. you were kind of anti exactly. anti intellectual. Sure. Sure. <laughs> There's no question you have to kind of decide about these, but no, they're they're good resources now. I mentioned the textbook alone yeah. gives you some introduction. You know, there's one chapter you can read in an hour on intellectual property. You know, so there are resources available. A lot on the web, obviously, things like that. Um, you know, there are many courses around the country that allow you to gain access to those kinds of things as well. So, um, but uh, terrific. Other comments about? Uh, I uh, just just to throw my two two cents in there, but um, I think in academia we have to be careful to maintain yes. a balanced diet yes. between basic research and something that is guided to translation. Yes. Because yes. if you think about it, really the major innovations yes. started as non-directed mm -hmm. basic research. I mean, you mm -hmm. couldn't think about uh, yes. landing right. anything on the moon without Newton right. yes. doing what he did on gravity. And uh, you couldn't think of yes. the robots 
Yes. At Stanford without yes. Rutherford yes. working on electricity. Yes. And I can go on and on and on. Yes. These people never had yes. any yes. application in mind. In fact, even I, yes. this ECGI yeah. 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 Uh, the cardio insight thing started because I was interested in uh, the mathematics of the inverse problem and the physics of it. So, you know, I never thought about it. And I never really predicted yeah. it would get to where it is today yeah. with a company yeah. that started in the lab yes. because the students had, and there was no help and no organization yes. in case yes. to do so. They did it because yes. they wanted to do it. Yes. So, you know, we have to be, I think this is exactly. all very important and, yeah. and very, and I think the industry has to get yes. more involved in it. Yes. Maybe it has to be the other way around. Yes. And after World War II, the, the, the university had become and the age dependent, yes. and, and, and they became money making yes. institutions. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. every almost every university in this yeah. country is run like a business. Yeah. It has to not be in the red, but be in the black. Yes. And that's why tuition is going up and up and up and up. Yeah. And that model cannot last forever. Yeah. So I would think that a yeah. lot of the innovation yes. and the and, uh, sort of directed research that yes. goes in your translation yes. has to be from greater participation yes. of the industry in yes. academic research yes. and well-defined yes. translational yes. level research yeah, um, should be funded probably more by the industry yes. on a longer term basis because yes. they, yeah. at the end, they're the ones who are reaping the fruit. Yeah. Yes. And so a lot of NIH money goes into yeah. a lot of research that at the end, yeah. you know, the Medtronic of the world are making money yeah. from. Yeah. I yeah. think so they should invest yes. in longer term because this model is not going to continue forever. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great comment. I agree entirely. Yeah, no, that's, that's indeed why I emphasize, I think, understanding the physiology and the understanding of really, because we're all in medicine, how things work is the first principle. Otherwise, you're never going to innovate anything. And then the same thing as well in terms of um, uh, industry. I think that's a real important uh, need to have people understand how they can, you know, early on invest so they can gain you know, the whole field can gain in the future. And I mean, even even the most abstract what you think about most imaginative abstract research yes. apparently had not because like yes. Einstein general relativity. Yes. You couldn't land precisely yeah. Yeah. A, a, a rover on Mars. Yeah. Yes. If uh, no, uh, yeah. I'm saying you do what yeah. you do, I mean, yeah. I, I no, can I guarantee you, I never yeah. thought about landing anything yeah. on Mars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a faculty from the engineering school yeah. and uh, um, in electrical engineering, yeah. and I work on miniaturizing electronic systems yeah. to be like, variable and implantable. Yeah. And uh, like definitely your talk is very, very interesting. Um, so when I try to approach kind of uh, a medical application. Yes. I think the biggest barrier is yes. I don't think I speak the same language. Yes, exactly. And, uh, That's right. Um, so a lot of times, like even though um, for me, I just want to get what's the design spec. Yes. But um, yeah. by trying to uh, look at the like medical uh, journals references, yes. it's hard to navigate. Yeah. Exactly. So um, what 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 are my no. thoughts about yeah. that? Yeah, so I think part of it is, is community. So that's why I really encourage this creating a community that people constantly interact and you have direct access to a variety of people. That's first of all really important because they need to know your work, you need to know their work, you need to talk and communicate so you can find the, the places that would best you utilize what you're working on and develop. So I think that's really where, I, that's why I stress that. Um, beyond that, again, we generally think, particularly in your area, is a really needs-based approach. So someone or even a group of people need to get together and look at different needs, understand your technology well enough to kind of feel that out and, and come up with what needs would really be, uh, would utilize your technology the best and really make it go through the paces of the needs because otherwise you'll find stuff and yeah, they'll be you know interesting, but they'll never really make it the whole way or very far probably, or as far as other things could be. Because you probably don't care as much 
that what exactly it is to utilize. You want it to reach and help patients. So that's really the key thing. So finding other colleagues in the medical community is a good way to do that, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, the other thing that you mentioned, I'm sorry. Sorry, thanks. No, the other thing that you mentioned was that the, you know, the, the long road and yes. very expensive road, yes. and that I think deters people. Yes, and exactly. And so the person yeah. who went to work for yes. Toyota yes. said, you know, yes. I can bring yeah. my invention yes. to the marketplace yes. in five years yes. if I start to do clinical studies exactly. and FDA approval. Yes. Yes. It takes years it and does. huge amounts of it money. Does. Absolutely. And, uh, you yeah, know, the, 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 right. the, the pharmaceutical industry right. gave up on a lot of drug development right. because of yes. the cost of clinical exactly. studies. Exactly. And, in fact, the FDA invited me to give them a talk yeah, yeah. about the possibility of using yeah. modeling yes. before you jump of into the court. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's another issue. Yeah. But, but the oversight is that, yeah. you know, the, the, there is tight regulation of this direct interaction with patients or direct effect on patients. Yes. But if you make cars unsafe, yes. you know, airbags explode yeah. in your face. Yes. So exactly. yeah, there has to be some scrutiny there yeah. also. Yeah, yeah, very true. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a related question. I heard a story about a week ago about the inventor of the hoverboard. Mm -hmm. It was this poor guy mm -hmm. who started a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And yeah instantly was swamped by yeah. copycat in yeah. Asia and right. so all the stuff that's out yeah. there he has no yeah. commercial no. Uh, yeah. adventure in. Yeah. And in medical uh, yes. technology there's the barriers with our FDA and that yes. sort of thing yes. that yes. prevent that to some extent. Do you, do you think we've yeah. reached a, a crisis in protecting intellectual property in the academic world? Is there, or do you, do you think there's still some reason to be hopeful that Ideas that um, we develop in this in this climate uh, can be commercialized and have some benefit to our institution. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll make my own personal comments. They're pretty. I don't have a lot of knowledge about it, but uh, I think mm, intellectual property is kind of a fuzzy area right now. I mean, I don't think the current patent office situation is really so um precise meaning we hear fairly frequently that multiple patents are issued on kind of competing areas which you kind of think well that's their job not to do that but it happens all the time so one of the big issues is is searching the patent literature which also we're not the best at but luckily it doesn't take much to get access to people who do have certain not that expensive luckily and their computers are really good at doing searches so you can get to the bottom fairly quickly of whether there is an, an opportunity uh, there. And so you don't have to spend a lot of money or resources or time you know, making that determination in general. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity. In fact, that's one of our biggest things we can do is to, because if it only comes down to patenting the idea, in many cases that's enough value because and I don't mean value necessarily money-wise. I mean you then identified the area of need, you figured out a reasonable solution to that, and you can then therefore take that to kind of anybody. And as long as it has, it meets those criteria of the needs, that it's a good enough need, someone's going to pick that up and run with that. So that's why at the beginning it's the idea and the need that really just you start with. And so you can do a lot of good by just taking that idea and seeing whether other people can help take it on. You don't even have to get involved in that. That could just be, you know, you know, whatever you want to do with it. And so for most of us, the university owns it, right? So we could just kind of say, oh, why don't you, you know, we could talk to somebody else and they can run with it or whatever you want to do. But that's kind of the kernel of what we can do as people who are knowledgeable about certain aspects, the field, the need, and, and maybe the solution. We can do that, so uh, that's a really good start. It really is. I think that's um, sometimes we think we've got to take it the whole way ourselves. No, I think if you have a patent on something that is again has the potential, that's really very valuable. Uh, and I, again, I don't mean this like monetarily of fostering the development of that because you capture that and created some path for somebody else to take. So I really encourage people to, to take that step. And it's not that hard. In an act, usually in a university, they'll help you do that. So it's not that bad for most of us. Someone else is going to do all the complicated stuff. 
you just have to be as descriptive as you can and analytical as you can. So one quick question for your advice. Uh, I think uh, this is more specific and related to uh, atrial fibrillation. And, uh, you really, your talk great and you touch a lot of technology and opinion, particularly atrial fibrillation. So we all know over the past five, six years, there are many new technologies, new yes. ideas. Yes, yes, From concept to yes. the devices. And uh, one of the examples is a single device, single shot device. Cry balloon. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, are we ahead of ourselves in terms of science or in terms of technology? Technology, you know, ahead of the science, or is this cry balloon, single balloon shot, is the future for atrial fibrillation versus the Some spot, other spotlight catabolation, if we will, pump yeah. yeah, that's a good. What, one. what is the future of the next five years? Yeah, yeah. Because of uh, the things that are a little confusion. Right. Sure. So um, uh, it is kind of like that paradigm uh, of surgery versus guided kind of therapy. It's another variation on that. Essentially, pulmonary vein isolation is this you know simplified lesion set, basically, right? It's an anatomic simplified lesion set. So, and we're just trying to find ways to do it better, so that at least we're doing something that's lasting. Um, so, I think anything that can foster that. Um, in my opinion, you know, personal, I'm pretty biased, and, but um, things like cryoballoon have succeeded in the extent that they form pretty reliable uh, lesions, and they also um, uh, are pretty easy to use and are very efficient in terms of workflow, et cetera. So they accomplish a lot of the needs for our field because you need a safe, reproducible, in, you know, an effective kind of thing to, that you can do. So I think it's a reasonable answer to that, it, with that paradigm in mind. But when you go beyond that paradigm, we really, then we kind of fall off, right? So it, that means persistent atrial fibrillation, long-standing, more complex, uh, advanced disease kind of things. We don't know the right paradigm right now. Uh, that's why going back to the surgical paradigm is probably kind of something at least you can go back to, you know, that seems the most tested. Uh, right now, so we're a little bit of a loss, right, because we've gone after the mapping now, so that's kind of taken us over to the side, and we're all trying to figure out, yeah, is that the right thing to do, or, you know, are we better off doing a more of a surgical, less invasive surgical approach that allows us to do those same lesion sets, but not really mapping them, so I think that's one of our biggest areas, but there are a lot of impediments, like uh, lesion formation, assessing lesion formation, all those things that are kind of simple because unless you can make good lesions, you know, your paradigm could be right or wrong, but you're not doing a lot of good. And so it starts there. And so I think that's where at least we know the goal is to create better lesions. Okay, that seems like a, at least it's technologically good. Some of our biggest problems, we don't understand mechanism well enough to really answer some of those other questions about how to go about solving the problem in terms of substrate selection, et cetera, and individualizing to the patient. So there's a big gap there. We're trying, the mapping side is a, is a chance to do that. But other than that, we're gonna have to kind of go back to the more surgical paradigm, in my opinion, you know. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.